Okay, let's talk mm-hmm. about the child, and I'm going to call this kid Daryl, who has frequent run-ins with the law and may be in prison. But you know, at some point, Daryl's going to get out of prison. How do you deal with that type of situation? It's not most of our clients who have children I'm in prison. I'm sure, I'm sure, but... We have made distributions to... Uh, <laughs> yeah, so... But we've it made does distri- happen. We, it does if you're dealing with something like that as a client, you really need to go talk to an attorney and get your estate plan in place because thinking that one of your kids is going to take care of it and manage it for the other kid is just, it's not going to happen. Life's Third Act is a podcast dedicated to helping you get the most out of your retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, attorney CPA Joe Cordell features guests each week to discuss prominent topics for those over 55. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Life's Third Act. Today we're going to talk about um, a subject that often I'll bet you don't talk about with others. And that subject relates to when we have children that, uh, of course, we love all our children, but we know that some of them have issues of various sorts. And these issues can take a variety of forms. We'll talk a little bit about that. But it really presents a bit of a challenge whenever you're thinking about your estate planning. You're thinking, I want to take care of my children, uh, but I have concerns about one or more and how do I plan in a way that will protect them perhaps from themselves? So we want to address that subject head on. We have Nina Windsor with us today, Tucker Allen, and, uh, and we want to address you know, how do you plan in a way that you take care of those children that are not perhaps real good at taking care of themselves? You want, you want me to <laughs> hand this hot potato to you? Oh, thank you so Nina. much. <laughs> Strong roots are essential for a healthy tree, especially your family tree. That's why you work hard to take care of your family every day. At Tucker Allen, we know that taking care of your family means planning for the future. Our team provides personalized estate planning to help you protect your family, your legacy, and your future. From wills and trusts to long-term care and estate planning, count on Tucker Allen. Personalized estate planning made simple. The long and short of it is this is something that comes in to my office all of the time. You, know, you mean daily, all of our clients don't have perfect basis. children? Or? They don't. Well, they did when they were talking to other parents at you know the high school PTO meeting. Right, but when right, they get right. into my office, the story is a little they bit different. They lay it all out. Yes. So they may start out by saying, you know, I, I ask about their family. My favorite part, hearing about somebody's family. And we get their names and how old they are and where they live. And, uh, and then it kind of shifts as far as what people are talking about until we get to the point of talking about who are going to be their successor agents. That's when you can kind of get a clue from most people whether they're comfortable naming certain children in a responsibility role in their documents. And are they really, like, honest? Do they lay it out there? Okay, I've got this son or daughter married and divorced multiple times or may have problems uh, being on the wrong side no. of the law. I bet that doesn't come at the beginning no, of the meeting, right away. does it? it it's I wouldn't think so. It, this is why this is not a good thing to have over a phone call, right? Because you have to watch people's body language. You have to watch their faces. Yeah. Hard to do when everyone was wearing a mask, too. I mean, you will catch glimpses between spouses even saying, and we're going to bring this up. We need mm-hmm. to talk about this. And so yeah. I'll, I'll call it out. I'll say, hey, I'm noticing you're a little iffy when you mention this person. Are there special circumstances that I need to know about? And oftentimes there are. I'm in a really big family. Every year somebody might fall into the category that we're about to discuss here. It may not be the same person every year, so it's a good idea to revisit your estate plan. But um, people have problems and they have challenges, and sometimes they're just their personality isn't set out to be the most responsible. And so I know that, you know, we don't like to label our children. Yeah. But you kind of had had come. I up do with when them. I'm aggravated with them. Yes. Right. Okay. Well, we can't. I don't know if we can say that on no, the air. No, probably not. <laughs> problem children. Yes, but problem children we can say. Yes. Um, yes. Well, it's something that that 
parents are sometimes reluctant when they come in to meet with us doing estate planning that they're reluctant to talk about it at first and and it and it sometimes requires some detective work on your part or at least some probing. It does, but it's not a competitive environment. I'm not going to share anything that's said in my office with anyone outside of my office. It's confidential. Um, it's a good opportunity to be as honest as possible. If you think about somebody who's coming into an attorney's office and you know it's criminal defense or something like that, they're going to... Their, their best asset is to be honest with their attorney. Right. And the same is true here. Be as honest as possible, be as forthcoming as possible, because you're going to get a better, more specific product that's tailored to your family situation. So let me throw a hypothetical at you, and this will give viewers uh, a chance to, to kind of understand what a solution would look like. Um, let's assume that a, a client is 65 years old. They have a son that is 30. Um, he's been through a couple of marriages. Um, he drinks, mm-hmm. and you you find that out. Can perhaps. we give him a name to make it fun? Okay, Bill. 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 So, Bill drinks, and uh, and the the parents have said that he's been through some treatment programs, and they haven't taken. Uh, There's a problem that really goes back a number of years, um, and that it's resulted in his ha- being perennially unemployed. So um, this is a problem that really affects his life in a significant way. And so the parents are saying, you know, we're afraid that if we leave this money to him, that he's going to he's going to either let somebody else take it from him or uh, or he's going to consume it himself in some fashion. Mm-hmm. So what is how do I do my state plan where I take care of Bill? And incidentally, I have four other kids that are fine. So I hate for <laughs> Bill to feel like I'm, you know, treating him unfairly. Singling him out. So I'm yeah. worried about, you know, how how Bill feels. If a client is worried about their son, Bill, and they want to make sure that Bill doesn't feel different from their other children, it's going to be really difficult if there's a big old provision that says, here's everybody else, and here's, how, here's what we're going to do about Bill. So... After you're gone, it's not really your problem anymore, but everyone will see a copy of your trust if you have drafted it. The beneficiaries will see it. The beneficiaries. It's a statute in Missouri that the trustee will send out a copy of the trust to all the beneficiaries. So keep that in mind if you're treating your children different as far as, you know, amounts are concerned. They're they're going to see that at that point. Yes. But for Bill's situation and for many other children, even children that you don't have these other issues with, you may want to put some restrictions on on the uh, way that the trust is distributing. You're not going to want to put outright and free of trust the way that you would say write a check to a charity. So we already know if I'm the attorney, I'm going to be taking a look at putting this money into a separate entity afterwards as opposed to writing a check to Bill. But then you can kind of deep dive because... I would ask the parents at that point, do they want Bill to have any control at all? Who do they want to be managing things to say how Bill is going to get money and what it can be used for? And then they may tell me that, you know, Bill's brother, James, is going to be a great person to be handling Bill's account and kind of being the banker for Bill. And then I will say, absolutely not. That's a terrible idea because you just created a situation where the person who gets to be the bad guy is one of your other kids. One, yeah. And yeah. Creating that really, friction. That, that's going to run a lot of Thanksgiving dinners to come. There, yeah, or there will just not be any. Yeah. There will be no Thanksgiving dinners no after relationship, the first, right. first year. And, and you could have someone who has maybe a a kind of a strained relationship that, that goes to no relationship and how heartbreaking it is for parents to think that after they're gone, that something that they did is going to cause a further divide amongst their children. So yeah. uh, what you're trying to do uh, as a, a person who's putting together a plan is to bring your family together and take care of them. You've worked really hard mm-hmm. for your money. If you're coming in and doing an estate plan, you you know, you want to make sure that you're, you, that is the, the primary focus. But embrace the limitations of the person when you're talking about a plan. So the limitations that that an attorney can put into place have to do with who's in charge of 
doling out the money to this person, but also communicating possibly some conditions for when the person would get the money. So maybe Bill doesn't get certain funds if he has uh, any issues within the last amount of years with, you know, driving violations while intoxicated or... um, Now, you can't do conditions that have to do with incentivizing someone not to be married because that's against public policy. So when you start to get like, oh, wow, I've got a a grocery store full of different things that I can think of, you know, and and I know my son really well. And so I'm going to think of these things that are going to either incentivize him or disincentivize him. You may have to take a step back and think about, are these things actually going to be enforceable? Mm -hmm. And so uh, the good news, though, is that um, there is a remedy, uh, meaning that the law can definitely fix your problem. But the issue is, you know, can it do it in such a way that there may not be a little resentment on the part of Bob? Uh, Bill. Bill, sorry. Bob's Bob Bob has a drug problem. We Bob, yeah, Bob's going to be. We'll the, talk about it. Yeah. But he, the good news is he doesn't drink. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here, but but here's one solution. What do you think about this one? So let's again, let's assume the other kids do not have a problem. Okay. So, what if we uh, create a trust in which um, we appoint a professional? I'm I'm thinking maybe there's a lawyer that your family knows. Mm-hmm. Maybe there is. Um, an accountant, somebody that you know and trust, maybe who shares your values. If you go to a church or a synagogue or whatever, maybe somebody from there. Those are often good candidates, incidentally, people who share your your religion and whatnot. Uh, but either way, it's somebody who's not too old and uh, and who you trust and has good judgment. And those people generally do, like an accountant, uh, dare I say a lawyer, a lawyer that knows your family, knows you all, et cetera. I like those choices because it solves one of the problems that you raised, Nina, about about a family member uh, getting, you know, g- causing conflict. Uh, but it could be a family member that, that wouldn't be so bad. Maybe, you know, an uncle or something mm-hmm. where, yeah, there's no doubt that Bill's going to be angry, but so what? So th- there's, there is that possible choice, but you get to choose whoever you want including an institutional trustee. I which was going to ask that. Yeah, like a yeah. bank. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, Bank or trust company. Uh, but generally they have to have more money for that, like several million, would you say? Not necessarily. No, it's based on a percentage. It's just when it becomes lucrative or, or, or advisable to do. So what do you think about the idea of creating a um, discretionary trust and that way the trustee you know the terms read the same so if it's a discretionary trust then the terms would read the same maybe have what's called uh, there's this there's a standard called hems which is very important uh, health education maintenance and support you uh, you maybe you could talk a little bit about that but you could Im- perhaps have that even with the others and uh, with with otherwise discretion as needed in that way, they would look the same. Correct. the The standard for distribution of health, education, maintenance, and support is something that coordinates uh, with the law and with uh, the Internal Revenue Code to allow for some protection, both from divorce and from creditors, for these distributions. You don't want to make that discretion outside of those things. And, and coincidentally, you know the the health education maintenance and support covers just about everything but uh, investing in your tangential friends Etsy shop or paying off gambling debts or funding alcoholism yeah you know so it really does cover just about everything that someone could need so it's and, very broad and the trustee gets to decide so it's the trustee yes. who decides you know which things he or she's going to pay out for. Correct. And so you may want to beef up your discretionary uh, ability to not make those distributions to the person if you have if the trustee has concerns that uh, the person is not going to really benefit that you're kind of doing it to their detriment to make that distribution. What you don't want to do as a trustee is make a distribution that is 
broader than what the language is because then you get into a problem where it can be subject to divorce and creditors. So, and and generally speaking, if we're talking about problem children, we want to restrict versus expand on how those distributions now, are would made. would it be advisable, and, and do you advise your clients to have a talk with their child, Bill, who has all these issues going on, so it's not a surprise after you die? Yes, I think we had a show about that earlier this year, about having those conversations, but it just depends on what stage Bill is at. Yeah. You know, it may be a very, com- it's not really any of Bill's business. Bill may think on his worst day, I definitely got cut out of the trust today. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he yeah. might think he's not getting anything at all. So it depends on how the relationship is. Um, if you have somebody who is an addict and they know that they are an addict and they are very open with the people around them that they are an addict, then having frank conversations with that family member and saying, I'm so proud of how you're doing right now, but I don't want to do something that's going to throw you off track by giving you access to all of this That's money. a good way to phrase that. Um, mm-hmm. Then I think. I, then that is a very caring thing to do. And somebody who's very self-aware about their problem with addiction as a disease will be more open to having that that conversation. But somebody who is currently in treatment, not doing very well, and or, or is just kind of overly optimistic and delusional about the problem that they have is not somebody that it's even worth having the conversation with, I would say, a, a good portion what of the What about time. leaving a letter in your, sure. you can do that. And, sure, say, and you don't have to pay an attorney to change that. So you could have a letter initially that says, I'm very disappointed and here's why I've put these restrictions. Yeah. Or you could have a, a letter later that says, I'm very, I, I'm very hopeful for what you're still going to accomplish. And I hope that you do really, you know, good things with this money. And, and here's why I've put, set it up right. this way. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, I know some talks are hard to do face to face, but, but the, the, the main thing to know though, is that you can create what's called a discretionary trust where you give this person now a lot of judgment. Uh, you place a lot of discretion in this person you choose. And incidentally, as we always say, have successors named in the event that this person resigns or dies or whatever. But but the uh, this would be in place for all your children. And, and it just means that this person exercising their judgment may choose on a given month to just give out, or over time, to just give out a monthly sum to Bill, whereas, by contrast, they may have given the other children, you know, fifty or a hundred thousand dollars for a house or things that that seem reasonable. You know, that may happen, but the point is, the trust will be the same. You have somebody who's using discretion, and they really are being fair. The fairness is that they know how to pay it out to Bill versus each of the other three children. And and you you but you're counting on their judgment because you've given them a lot of authority when you give them you know the largest discretion possible, and as a trustee, uh, but you also have protected it from lawsuits and and spouses. You mentioned Bill had had a couple of divorces, possibly right. as a as right. a result of the uh, alcoholism. And then, and one phrase that I love to see, and, and I, I have used several times, is financial acumen. If you use the fa- phrase financial acumen, it could be, I have really bad uh, judgment with re- respect to women, or I have really bad judgment with respect to choosing to drink too much, but it affects my judgment with respect to money. And so you can kind of lump it into that where it doesn't look so insulting to the person that someone is is targeting as far as this protection and, and these Yeah, uh, I think that rings nicer. Yeah. And it, so the trustee can make a decision on whether to distribute on the basis of the beneficiary's financial acumen. The trustee can also make a decision on turning over the reins for for a trust, possibly, and allowing that beneficiary to become their own trustee on the basis of financial acumen or not. A lack of financial acumen will kind of tighten those reins. Okay, let's talk mm-hmm. about the child, and I'm going to call this kid Daryl who has frequent run-ins with the law and may be in prison. But you know at some point Daryl's going to get out of prison, and but it may be, you know, you know, you may pass away before you see your We've, child get out. So how do you deal with that type of situation? 
Not most of our clients who have children I'm in prison. Sure, I'm sure, but we have made distributions to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, hope so but we've it made does distri- happen. We, it does. We've made distributions to commissary accounts uh, for the benefit of the of the child, um, and you know, there's there's different ways to deal with things. But if you're dealing with something like that as a client you really need to go talk to an attorney and get your estate plan in place because thinking that one of your kids is going to take care of it and manage it for the other kid is just, it's not going to happen. Hmm. Yeah, it, and, and there are uh, there are those kids, though, that, that you can leave room that if they do improve in some way, as you said a while ago, mm-hmm. that the nice thing about it is you draft this language the way you want it, your lawyer will draft it, but the point is, It'll, it'll allow you to anticipate change and to give authority expressly to a trustee to consider that. And that often occurs like if a parent wants a child to graduate from college. You know, you'll get this money if you get your degree. We have a fancy term, condition precedent. So oh, I like that. that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm learning so, all kinds of good legal yeah, I know. So today. things that things that have to happen before you get funds. There's different, mm-hmm. there are different... Um, concerns about structuring things that way uh, just because of that still wanting to have the divorce and creditor protection. So we will caution you on the benefits as there is to everything you do in life, benefits and disadvantages Mm -hmm. to choosing a a certain path uh, on an estate plan and on that language. But um, one thing that you cannot do is mandate that a kid, you know, marry someone from a certain religion or something like that. In order to get I've money. seen so many Lifetime movies like that. Yeah, that's it. It uh, won't, it's won't hold real. up in court. It's not real. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's entertaining. So though. we could we could have a whole a whole thing about public policy and and terms in your trust and whatnot. But yeah. just keeping your your expectations um, reasonable and making sure that what someone puts in an estate plan is really designed to protect that child, to protect the other children in your family, to keep everything very organized Mm -hmm. and linear um, while still contemplating that there are limitations to certain individuals. And you're definitely not going to have that individual as a trustee or as a power of attorney agent, but taking it a step further that they probably should not get a check. And, uh, you know, I like to think of it, too. It's not to punish this child. It's to continue parenting them beyond the grave. It's to protect them from themselves, just as you protect them while you're alive when Mm -hmm. you're raising them, hopefully, you know? And the wonderful thing about this is that it, it has asset protection for a person who, among all people, most needs asset protection. Yes. In other words, creditors, uh, lawsuits from people they might have you know, harmed in a car accident, all those scenarios where, where we would think that this money that you've left for your child are at risk, and there are a lot of ways in which that can happen, probably the most prominent of which happens through marriage. But in any case, you can protect your child from all of those. And, and incidentally, I think we kind of imply this when we're talking. The idea of including the additional children other than Bill is is often something we would suggest to you anyway. Not that they would be treated the same way in the way it's paid out, uh, but but by giving this trustee the discretion we we're describing, then you could have it paid out over time in a different way, of course, to the more responsible children. But the whole idea is to give them all the benefit of having it inside a trust where it's not dumped on the table, all of it dumped on the table for any of the children. Because remember, all of them are at risk, just not as much at risk in the same way as somebody who is what we're calling problem children. These other kids can be victims of failed businesses, bankruptcy, uh, lawsuits, bad marriages, um, all sorts of things, partnerships that go bad. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of ways in which right. this person, this child could be victimized, you can protect your children from that in a way that they're not capable of themselves because they can't create this sort of stainless steel container that you're, trea- you're creating for them with this trust. So you're doing a favor to the other four kids, but you'll just give a little different rules to the trustee as to how it's paid out. So maybe those rules will be more permissive for the other kids, meaning pretty much maybe they can have it when they want it within reason. So you don't want to deprive them of the ability to go out and buy stuff. But um, 
you may want, if it's, I'll choose a number, call it $500,000 a piece. So you wouldn't want the 500000 I can tell you, the 500000 goes to any child, e- even the other four. If they're married or they become married, I'm willing to wager that that's going to be a marital asset sooner or later and probably sooner. And just because it's complicated, you have to dot the I's and cross the T's to keep it separate. So some of the things we're saying here are going to be good for all kids, but we're wanting to specifically talk to you about you know, about how you can have peace of mind for you know, this special child in some way. My mom likes to call it the lowest common denominator for things. You know, that anchoring uh, level of making sure that someone can understand something, you know, when you're when you're giving mm-hmm. a presentation. Well, in this case, if you're planning, you want to make sure that your document encompasses provisions for that basic, you know, person that you're the most worried about. And then it'll by definition, also protect all of, of of the people who might be doing better than that person. So, mm-hmm. you know, kind of taking it down to that level uh, and contemplating that very specifically in a document is, is going to cause a lot of uh, additional protections to be in place that you can't take care of after you're gone. So, And another thing that we can throw in here, though, is that for that next generation, you're able to have what's called a dynasty trust. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you can now provide for these grandkids that you may not know as adults yet. Some of you do, of course, but some of you don't, meaning... Or who haven't been born. Yeah, uh, unborn even. Uh, And you can go ahead and create a trust now that, well, whatever's not distributed would be available to those children under the same conditions, meaning you have a trustee you trust. At that point, it may be a successor trustee, but you've chosen who that is, or you've allowed, sometimes people will allow their their trustee to choose the successor trustee. So however you do it, though, it's continuous care for these loved ones, generation after generation, at least those two generations. And and you can you don't need to know those children because you, you're counting on a responsible trustee that will use his or her discretion in a payout. Out. And, you know, presumably paid over time, no more than is reasonable uh, at any given time just to allow protection to all of them. It's a really powerful tool and it gives a lot of peace of mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so trusts are a marvelous, marvelous thing. And that's the reason we talk about trusts a lot. You can get so much done with them. Oh, we've got to be sure and do a show where we talk about how you can create a trust for to take care of things. Like we talked about animals at one point, which we can revisit. Pets, but, I love that one. But you can also take care of like art and things of value that, that you want to have for up to a period, I think, of 21 years. Yes, I'd, a, I'd love to nerd out on that with you. Yeah, be fun. yeah, yeah. That, so there's some cool stuff no, you can no. do for those of you who have collections and you think, boy, I'd like this collection to be exhibited or or, or you want to know that it's taken care of some period of time. You can do that with a trust too. So much control. Yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful tool. So time has gone quickly. Uh, this has been another episode of Life's Third Act. Till next time, take care. You've been listening to Life's Third Act a podcast for thriving in retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. Each week we discuss topics and answer questions to help you better plan for your future. For more information, visit tuckerallen.com. Subscribe and listen again next week for another edition of Life's Third Act. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.